Good morning, church. Welcome to Free Spirit Fellowship this morning. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let the people of the Lord say so. Amen. Let's give God a hand praise right now. Amen. As we invite and welcome his presence into our homes, into our church, into our service today. In Jesus' name, we pray, God, that you will touch and move upon us, Lord. Hallelujah. Anybody feel like praising the Lord? Let's see. I feel like praise and praise I feel like praise and praise Him. Praise Him in the morning. Praise Him all day long. I feel like praise and praise Him. When I feel like praise and praise I feel like praise and praise Oh, praise Him in the morning Praise Him all day long I feel like praise and praise If you don't want to praise it, don't hinder me if you don't want to praise him, don't hinder me. Praise him in the morning, praise him all day long. I feel like praise and praise in me. And I feel like praise and praise in me. I feel like praise and praise in him. Praise him in the morning, praise him all day long. I feel like praise and praise in him. Well, if you don't want to praise him, don't hinder me. If you don't want to praise him, don't hinder me. Praise him in the morning, praise him all day long. I feel like praise and praise in him. Come on and praise him while you have a chance. Oh, come on and praise him while you have a chance. Praise him in the morning. Praise him all day long. I feel like praise and praise in him. Sing it again. Come on, praise the Lord while you have a chance. Come on, praise the Lord while you have a chance. Praise him in the morning. Praise him all day long. I feel like praise and praise in him. I feel like praise and praise in him. I feel like praise and praise in him. Praise him in the morning. Praise him all day long. I feel like praise and praise in him. Well, I feel like praise and praise in him. Thank you, Lord. I feel like praise and praise in him. Praise him in the morning. Praise him all day long. I feel like praise and praise in him. Won't you praise him in the morning? Praise him all day long. I feel like praise and praise in him. Oh, won't you praise him in the morning? Praise him all day long. Well, I feel like praise and praise in him. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We've come to worship and to praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. We're going to sing another one here. Your grace 
and mercy has brought me through. Hallelujah. Thank God for his grace and mercy that has saved us today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The song goes like this. Your grace and mercy brought me through. Praise you too. I want to thank you and praise you too for your grace and mercy brought me through. and mercy has brought me through. I'm living each moment because of you. I want to thank you and praise you too. For your grace and mercy brought me through. Thank you for saving a sinner like me.
grace and mercy. Thank God. They paid the price. Once I was blind, but thank God I see. All your grace and mercy came and rescued me. today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen for your grace and mercy. All right. I'm going to sing this course. Might be new to most of you, but it's a good old timey course. Amen. Let's worship God in it. Hallelujah. You don't know. You don't know what the Lord has done for me. You don't know. You don't know what the Lord has done for me. You don't know because you weren't there. You don't know where and you don't know where. You don't know what the Lord has done for me. You don't know what the Lord has done for me. You don't know what the Lord has done for me. You don't know you weren't there. You don't know when. You don't know where. You don't know. What the Lord has done for me. See it again. You don't know. You don't know what the done for me. You don't know what the Lord has done for me. You don't know the word that you don't know when. Don't you don't know where? You don't know. You don't know how the Lord saved me. You don't know how the Lord saved me. You don't know because you went there. You don't know where. You don't know where. You don't know how the Lord saved me. Yeah. 
you right now. Amen. All right. Well, we have a prayer request this morning. A friend of Sister Marianne, uh, whose name is Donna, fell and broke her hip, it, and it's not healing. So we want to pray for her right now, for, for Marianne's friend Donna. In Jesus' name, touch it. Oh, God, we ask, God, as we pray right now, Lord God, and we pray the prayer of faith, and we ask, God, that it go forth. Let the anointing to heal the sick and to save the lost, deliver the oppressed. Go forth, God, right now, I pray in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I pray right now that you will cover us and protect us by the blood of the Lamb. Watch over us, Lord God, from this terrible pandemic that is going around and save and preserve us through this time of crisis, I pray. I pray the blood of Jesus upon your people right now, God, in Jesus' name. Bless us in our finances, O oh Lord God. Bless us in our health. Bless us in basket and in store. Keep your mighty hand of grace upon us today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, let's give him my praise and thank him today for his goodness. He heals and he saves. Oh, what a mighty deliverer. Thank you, Jesus. 
Praise you, Jesus. Amen. I want to just make an announcement, a couple of announcements again, reminding you still, amen, uh, we're talking about trying to keep the 30-minute-a-day prayer challenge. And for those of you that uh, can do it, and hopefully everyone can find some time to pray. Even if you can't pray 30 minutes a day, try at least to pray 30 minutes a couple of days, two, three days out of the week. Set aside some time to pray because if there was ever a time that the church needed to be on their knees praying, right? It is right now in this time that we're living, a very serious and dangerous time. So I want you to continue to do that and, and pray and seek the face of the Lord. Amen. It it looks like that things are going to start opening up here in the state. And uh, the governor has said that we can start having drive-in services. So next Sunday, the Lord willing and weather permitting, we are going to be having a drive-in parking lot service at the church. And how it will work is simply is you'll drive to the back side of the church, the back parking lot, and we'll park our cars with one car space at least in between. And if you want to bring, you can stay in your car if you want to do that. Or you can bring folding chairs and set them up uh, either in front or behind your car, not on the side of your car. Uh, because we want to keep social distancing from the people in the car next to you. Uh, wear face mask if you feel like you need to. Uh, we will be outdoors, so uh, so there should be a minimal uh, concern about spreading the virus outdoors, but if you feel like you need to wear a safe mask, please do so. Uh, we are going to keep social distancing, and we are not going to allow the children to go play on the playground. It's very important. The children have to stay with the families. So we're asking families that live together, stay together, and not mix and match between us because we do not want to. Uh, we do not want to break the idea of keeping our space, keeping our social distancing. So bring your folding chairs. You might want to bring an umbrella in case the sun gets real hot. Uh, we'll be setting up the music and I'll be preaching from the hill behind the church. Uh, so it will be Sermon on the Mount. It should be interesting. We'll do this on Sundays. I don't think we can really do this on Wednesday evenings because it gets dark and it gets, it gets buggy. So it's likely that we'll continue to broadcast from home on Wednesdays, but on Sundays at least uh, we will we will uh, attempt to do that. And there will be some protocols that we'll need to follow concerning the use of the bathrooms. And Sis Lafayette is sending those protocols out. She'll be emailing you what those protocols will be uh, concerning that, because we want to be practice uh, safety protocols as much as possible. So, uh, amen. All right, so we're looking forward to being able to get together again. Amen. And now that we can also get together in groups of 10, we may, uh, we may at some point be able to have smaller meetings uh, that way. I'm looking forward to being able to resume my Bible studies again, my physical Bible studies because of the group of 10 rule. But I also am teaching the home Bible study, exploring God's Word home Bible study Online, I'm up to less than 10 out of 12. I hope to post those next following lessons, 11 and 12. I hope to post them this coming week. And I must say, continue to pray for the home Bible study course because it is getting large amounts of viewership and distribution out across the web. Who knows where this will go and what could be the result of being able to teach I mean, I've taught hundreds and hundreds of Bible studies in the last uh, 40 years of my ministry, but I've never taught the Bible study to the whole world, and now I am. Amen. So who knows what will happen? We want to continue to pray about that. So aren't you excited? We're picking up subscribers every week, and uh, this this thing is, is helping us. It might be hindering us from getting together to fellowship, but it is helping the church to grow in other ways that we had never expected it might. Amen. So let's just pray right now that God's word, the gospel, the gospel message that we believe and preach will be carried around the world as a result of this pandemic. That Satan meant it for the harm of the church and the people of God, but God will turn around 
and use it for his blessing. Let's pray right now in the name of Jesus, we're praying and we're believing, Lord God, that as we send out the word of God, as we preach the word, that this message, Lord, will go, will fall on ears and in countries where it might be forbidden otherwise to get in. Lord God, that somewhere, somehow, someone will hear it and they will be convicted and converted and saved. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray right now. All right, we're going to get into the preaching of the word this morning. You've got your Bibles, make sure you get your Bibles out. And uh, we're going to the word of God today. I want to direct your attention to the epistle of First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse number 1. <clears throat> All right. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. But when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Oh, hallelujah. Let's praise God today for the word of the Lord. And we ask God for the anointing to come upon it right now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, touch us, Lord, I pray. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So this morning I want to preach on seasons, seasonings, and becoming season of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. When God created our universe on day four, he set our giant time clock in space, infinitely calibrated down to the finest atomic seconds. And when he sent the sun and the moon and the stars and their courses in the sky, he ordained that they should be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And so it has been from the beginning of time. And when Israel needed help and counsel with wisdom concerning what to do, God saw to it that there were such men, the children of Issachar, First Chronicles 12 and 32 tells us, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We're going to talk to you about times and seasons and, and seasonings and learning how to become seasoned. <clears throat> the times that we're in are very concerning to everyone and they're on everybody's mind. They're in the news continuously. And I know that they are of great concern to all of us. They were of concern to the disciples. In Acts chapter 1 and 6, the, the query of the disciples was, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So here they were, Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives, just about ready to ascend into heaven. He's about to give them his final uh, punch list, his final uh, wisdom and instruction, and all they can think about is, is that maybe he would set up the throne of David again and kick the Romans out. They had entirely missed the point. Apparently, they had been following him for three and a half years, but for all the wrong reasons, they totally missed what he had been telling them and teaching them. It's an amazing thing how... Uh, when we are in the pulpit, we're trying to communicate to people. It's amazing what goes into people's minds. It's, it's not necessarily the words that they hear, but it's, it's the between the line words that were not said. Uh, some folks just have uh, an ability to put context in meaning where it is not and derive some kind of an understanding out of what they've heard that was never intended to be understood that way. And so they get all twisted up in their thinking because the, the context uh, does not apply to them. They are off on their own thought, 
thinking other things, wondering about other things. Well, this is the way the disciples were. Jesus would teach them. He was showing them. He was teaching them, but they just had their minds somewhere else. And they were thinking different things. Their fondest dreams and their highest hopes were for a temporary solution. When God had a much bigger picture in view, in mind, the evangelism of the whole world with a brand new message from God that had never been heard before. It's an amazing thing how they missed it, how they skipped right by it. And it often happens with us as well. Amen. We're in a situation where uh, we have our view of uh, our understanding, our view, our concern. Uh, but God is working in that situation with a much bigger picture or view in mind that we could have ever, ever imagined in our lifetime. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God that he knows the way. He knows what he is doing. He knows the right plan. He knows the right step. We just need to learn to, to obey, to submit, to follow him. It is not for you and I to know the times nor the seasons. Jesus said to his disciples, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. In other words, God's got this. God's got this thing. But we're to do what we can do to get God's message out to the whole world. So that's what I'm going to say to you today, church. Wherever we are right now, whatever season or time that we're in, whatever situation we're in, we need to tell ourselves, God's got this. He has this thing. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the anointing. Amen. When I speak it. Amen. God has this. Amen. Whatever what we thought or whatever we think or whatever we're concerned about or whatever we're worried about. Well, amen. We need to just put our trust in the Lord and understand, hallelujah, that God knows the time and the season. Only God knows the time and the season and what is meant to be gotten from that situation. Hallelujah. God is in charge. He's in charge, as in Daniel 2. 21 and 22, which declares, and he, God, changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings. He setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and light dwelleth with him. Oh, what a God we serve. Hallelujah. Amen. That we can just rest in the moment. We can rest and relax and trust God and say, Lord, God, there's trouble on every hand and there's worry and concern and reason for anxiety and lots of folks are anxious. But Lord, I'm not going to be anxious because I know that you have it. I know you've got it. I know you know the time and you know the season and you know what it is that you're trying to get out of it. Hallelujah. I, I love what this verse said. Amen. He revealed the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness? What is in the darkness? Darkness scares a lot of people. And perhaps you can remember as a child, and most children have these experiences uh, of being afraid of the dark. And uh, when you were, went to bed at night, you know, lay in the bed and the lights were out, and uh, you, you might worry uh, about what was in the closet. Is there something hiding in the closet? And you might be convinced of it. Some children worry about what's under the bed. Some children worry about what's in the darkest corner of the room. And so for years and years and years, you can battle in your childish mind, struggling with fear of what is in the darkness. I still can remember being about five years of age. My mother... Uh, gave uh, my mother was a skilled and talented uh, crafts person in, in sewing. She made our clothes, she made clothes for other children, but she also bought patterns and made stuffed animals. Uh, I had one stuffed animal that I particularly loved. I was still a child in St. Paul, Minnesota, when uh, my mother tells me, I don't remember this, but. We went into a department store and I saw a stuffed animal dog, a little dog. It looked like a lassie or a collie dog. It had 
uh, you know, a fur body, but it had the plastic, you know, nose and face. And I fell in love with that dog and I would not leave the store without it. Uh, so my mother bought it for me and uh, I gave that dog a name. He was Dicky Dog. And Dicky Dog slept with me every night. Dicky Dog had the favorite position right up near my head. So I can, I still can remember I had one of my dad's old Navy blankets uh, that he had brought home from service, and it was a wool blanket, and that was my favorite blanket. And I'd cover myself with that blanket. Dicky Dog would camp out by my ear, by the side of my head, or off by my shoulder, and I would surround myself all the way around with all the stuffed animals in a circle all around me. And, I, and in my mind, I would pretend that I was camping out and I had a campfire, and, and I had all my animal friends surrounding me so nothing could get through to scare me. And, uh, you know, so as long as I had my blanket and my animals there beside me, I was not afraid. I, I could fall asleep. So many stories about things like that. Dicky Dog stayed with me till I was 12 years of age. It was when we moved up to New York State. My family moved up to New York State to pioneer work uh, that I finally found the strength to let Dicky Dog go. Now, I hadn't been sleeping with him when I was 12. I had him up on the bookshelf by then. He'd set up on the bookshelf where he could watch over me at night. But uh, but he, he was he was hard to part with. Let's just put it that way. He had been such a comfort to me. And uh, I, I speak about that because even as we are grown up uh, persons, yet still uh, there is a fear of the unknown. What is in the darkness? Whatever the unknown situation is in your life, whatever the anxiety or the concern is that you're dealing with, that's your darkness. Hallelujah. But I'll pay to tell you this morning, God knows what's in the darkness. He knows what's in the darkness. And with God is light. Hallelujah. And he is the light of the world. And when we allow his light to come into our life, amen, it can shine into the darkness of our light and illuminate it and remove our fear and take our fear away. Oh, thank God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're going through a dark time. And some people are in a dark place. Is that you? But I want to tell you, God knows what's in your darkness. Hallelujah. He knows what's in there. So you don't have to worry. Trust God and live right. Live right. Obey the word. Live right. Be righteous. And you will be fine. Amen. God will fix it for you. Hallelujah. God will fix it. Seasons come and go. This spring came at last, finally. It looks like this week. Uh, it came, this spring came at least, in my opinion, came at least a month late. I've seen snow in early April, but in May, that just ain't right. It's not right. I still have trees on my property that are only just now coming into bud. When typically all the trees come into bud in the first week, second week, of May and by my birthday already the trees are budding and in leaf but it's a month later almost amen before uh, we've actually seen uh, the evidence of spring really being here finally being here so we're talking about seasons John Mason in his book you can do it said fears are like babies fears like babies grow bigger by nursing them. If you're an anxious person, if you're a worry wart, you know very well the truth of that. And it gets in your mind and you begin to be obsessed with it and you can't think of anything else and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And he also said, I I must act, we must act in spite of fear and not because of it. We must act in spite of fear and not because of it. This is what we're going to have to do to get through this season of time and through this dark place. He also says that there is a winter time in God. It is a season of preparation, a revelation, and a direction. It is also a time when the roots grow. 
God wants to establish the right foundation in you during this season, but there is no harvest right now. There is a springtime in God. It is a time of planting and hoeing and nurturing. In other words, hard work. God wants you to work your plan, yet there is no harvest in springtime. There is a summertime in God. Summer is a time of great growth. And now is the time when activity, interest, and people begin to surround your God-given idea. And for all the activity of summer, there is only minimal harvest. But then comes autumn. This is God's harvest time. It is during this season that the harvest is reaped in much greater proportion than the work or activity expended. But most people never make it to the fall. Often they end up quitting along the way because they did not know what season they were in. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. If you don't understand seasons, you can never get to the point of seasoning. Amen. And that's the next point that I want to make is about seasoning, things that season us. So let's talk about seasoning. Jesus told us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees because pride puffs up. Self-righteousness is not true holiness. And it will lead to a false Con, a false idea or concept of salvation. A religion can't save you. Faith in a religion or its principles cannot save you. Even the practices of a liturgy cannot save you. The only thing that can save you is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as the scriptures have said, being born again of water and of the spirit according to the word of God. Baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins and the infilling or baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues as that Spirit gives you the utterance. That is God's plan of salvation for you. But that only opens the door. Amen. There is a life that must follow. You began a journey. And we're responsible for the actions in the journey that we take between our new birth experience, which opened the door to the kingdom, and our final experience on deathbed that will stop the momentum of the life that we've had on this planet, on this earth. Amen. And so this is the part of our life that we learn to become seasoned in. We need to become seasoned. We need seasoning. Jesus said in Luke 14 and 34, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Amen. Jesus is the salt and the light of the world. Amen. And if he is the salt, he needs to be applied to us so that we can be seasoned. Let me ask you today, what is seasoning your life? There's a cliche in the world that says variety is the spice of life. Things can season us. And while that may be true, variety is the spice of life and it makes life enjoyable. But what seasonings are in your seasoning chest, in your seasoning cabinet, or on your seasoning shelf? What are your favorite seasonings? If you're a chef, if you're a cook, in the kitchen, no doubt, you have bottles and bottles of, of seasonings that perhaps most people have never even heard of. If you love to cook, you will understand this. For most of us, a little salt and a little pepper goes a long way. Uh, some of us like things a little spicier than others. So we have all those kinds of seasonings. Brother Dan likes his peppers. He likes some hot he can eat them hotter than anybody that I know and not break a sweat. But most people don't like two things to be too hot. You, you, you can keep your ghost peppers. I like a little, but not too much. 
A little cayenne is good, but not too much. Amen. And so, uh, so uh, you might have somebody in your home. You might have somebody in your home that that really uh, does not like a whole lot of seasonings, and so they're always standing over your shoulder if you're cooking, and they want to know what you're putting in the food uh, because uh, they don't care a whole lot for all the different kinds of seasonings. Just give me the basics. But other people like to make it fancy. Well, whatever suits you, whatever floats your boat. Amen. That's good. But there's a variety of seasoning in the world that is not healthy and not good for us. We need to be careful what is seasoning us. And for a worldly person to say variety is the spice of life might be encouraging us to use the devil's seasonings and to go the devil's way and to think that uh, the things that worldly people do to make their life uh, more pleasurable uh, is the way that we ought to travel and what we ought to do. We need to stay out of the devil's uh, seasoning cabinet and stick with the salt of Jesus Christ in our life. Has the good salt gone out of your life? How is your Christian testimony doing right now? Now, we all have to deal with the hidden man of the heart, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. We have to deal with these things. The world, lust of the flesh, pride of life. And most of the time, if we're spirit filled, the Holy Ghost can keep those hidden things of the heart in check most of the time. And if the Holy Ghost is not doing it, then reason and common sense and fear of the consequences of sin may push down and push back those hidden things of the heart, those lusts of the flesh. But in order for lust to operate, it needs a trigger. Amen. The capacity to do the wrong is there. And temptation comes along and gives us an opportunity. We have the capacity born and bred in us because we're born in sin and shaped in the kingdom. Temptation's purpose is to give us the opportunity to do the wrong thing. But the capacity and the opportunity alone will not be responsible for the action. There needs to be a trigger. Now, if you have the Holy Spirit, if you're in the Bible, if you know what the Word of God says, if you have a pure heart and a conscience to want to live for God, you won't you will find that that will block the lust, the capacity, and it will block the opportunity. Some people find it much easier to resist temptation than other people. Think about children, those of you that have children. Every child's personality is different. And in every family, there is going to be one child that's, you know, just a goody two-shoes. One child that's just good most of the time, that's easy to raise, easy to get along with. You don't have to discipline that child much. You don't have to speak to them much. They're very sensitive and they want to please you and they want to do the right thing. They're easy to raise. It's not so hard for them uh, to resist the capacity and the opportunity to do wrong. It's much easier. God bless them. We love them. But then you always have that little black sheep of the family, that one that no matter what you say, uh, no matter what you tell them, they're bound and determined to defy it and to, and to go their own way, to do their own thing. You can tell them ever so much. You can tell them ever so. You can warn them ever so much. And they know it's coming. They know discipline is coming. And they'll look you right in the face and do it just the same and just defy you to correct them, defy you. Those, those, those little black sheep, they have a hard time denying the capacity and the opportunity to do wrong. But we need to have mercy on them. God has mercy on them and he has mercy on us. And we are all like that in some way or another. We're God's children to some degree or another. Every one of us, amen, is made in such a way that either we're easy to get along with for God and it's easy for us to do uh, the right thing, and we're sensitive to the Holy Ghost, or 
Or maybe we just can't help it. It's just in us. That nature to defy. Amen. And we need more grace and more mercy than other people. So the Holy Ghost blocks the capacity, lust, the opportunity, temptation. And when it's working in our life, it works perfectly. But what happens when it's not there? Will our reason save us? Will our common sense save us? Will our good conscience save us? Will our fear of the consequences of sin save us? Sometimes. But those hindrances and blocks to falling away from doing the right thing, maybe not as strong as the Holy Ghost. They're a little bit weaker. They can work, but they're a little bit weaker. But there is something that I believe there are many things that can trigger the capacity when the opportunity comes along. Uh, and we, we could talk about many different kinds of triggers, but there is one trigger that especially I want to talk about today that I believe and am convinced is a great trigger that causes people to do the wrong thing. And that is stress. Let's talk about stress in your life. It's perhaps the most significant trigger that causes us to engage in incorrect and improper behavior. And stress is right now causing all kinds of bad behavior because of the season or the time that we're living in. We're hearing that sales of alcohol are up over 300% and that drug addictions are going through the roof right now and that that suicide hotlines and helplines are ringing off the hooks and that for uh, people that are involved in rehabilitation programs and rehabilitation centers, relapsing and falling off the wagon is becoming a very, very serious problem. Uh, I heard one, uh, one man who uh, works in, in rehab talk about it and say that he's getting calls all the time from people that have been 20, 25 years sober are relapsing because of the stress in their life that is going on right now. So what makes a Christian young man or an older Christian man or woman raised up in the church, goes to Sunday school, has teen youth programs, goes to camp meetings, what makes such a person fall into strange and dark, sinister, sinful practices? What makes a Christian who ought to know better misbehave? What stressors are operating in their life or in their family's life? I want to speak about that because uh, this is part of what seasoning is about. And so uh, if stress is an issue in your life, and it will be, and here's particularly what I'm thinking right now. When you grow up into adulthood, uh, you're young and you're taken care of at home by, by your parents and by your family until, until you get out on your own. I was just sharing with my wife this morning. I, I've talked to you about uh, the robins that nested under our deck and how uh, they this one nest of robins had three little birds in it. And on my birthday, the mother kicked the birds out of the nest. And I think she did it a bit early. They were still fledglings. They still had little fuzzy feathers around their head. They weren't really ready to get out on their own. They could fly a little bit. And so they, they flew off into the trees behind the house and Last week, and so I, I noticed the mother, the little bird sitting up on the limb and just crying their little robin song. And the mother out frantically around the yard digging, getting worms and flying up to the branch and feeding the, the baby robins on the branch. And that was a, a week or so ago. And this morning I looked down in the yard. Here's the mother bird hopping along and a little, a little robin. I mean, it's almost full grown, but you can tell it isn't quite full grown yet. Right behind her, just, just. Crying and crying, and the mother bird gets a worm, turns around, and feeds that that teenager robin. That, that teenager robin ought to be old enough to be able to take care of itself. 
but the, but there, there's three of them, and they were all together in a family group. But this one little robin was just right on her mother's tail, just crying, 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 working her mother to feed them. Hadn't learned yet how to get out on their own and live life. And, and they haven't learned how. They haven't figured yet out how to feed themselves and take care of themselves. They're still dependent. And so how like that in humanity, uh, you know, we, we raise our children and they become teenagers. They start to become independent. They start to be, uh, you know, to pull back a little bit and, 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 uh, and, and uh, have their own ideas about things. And that's natural and normal. Amen. Because they're, they're working their way toward getting out on their own. But finally they, they get it. And, and you, and you finally get to where you kick them out of the nest, you know, and uh, you're an empty nester now. And here's your little family, and they're going off, and they get married, and they start having kids of their own. Now they're still young, young people, and there's, and you've raised them in the church. They were born and raised in the church, went to Sunday school. You did all the right things. You did the best thing you could, amen, to show them the right way to live. But still, they have to figure out for their own selves what life is about. And they don't know about a lot of things, maybe a lot of things the older generation was saved from and know very well the poison and danger of the seasoning of the world. Our little fledglings, our little robins, our little ones that we raise up, they don't understand that. They don't know about those things, but they're out there and they're, they're seasonings that the world is offering you. This is what the world is offering you. Amen. And the Bible says the pleasures of sin are for a season. Doesn't say that they don't have pleasure. Sin does have its own pleasures but it does not last. And the consequences are very dangerous and deadly. I think of the young Joseph sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers, the dreamer of dreams, a young man that God had his hand on in his life. And you know the story, he worked for Potiphar and uh, Potiphar's wife enticed him and tempted him. She was constantly at him to have an affair. She wanted to live in adultery with this young Hebrew lad. And he knew better. He knew it was the wrong thing to do. And he continuously resisted her. And finally, he pushed away from her. And she, she could not stand being rejected, so she accused him falsely. And he got into great trouble there. He got thrown into jail. He didn't do anything wrong. What I like about the story of young Joseph was that even though he was young, he had seasoning beyond his age and beyond his experience. We need to learn how to become seasoned by the salt of Jesus Christ. Amen. We, we do. We tend to fall. You know what? When we fall, we tend to fall backwards, not forward. Spiritually, when we fall, we tend to fall backwards, not forward. But behind us is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that is the path of destruction. Satan always makes it look like backsliding is the easy way out. He makes it look like that the season of the world, the laven of the world, is the shortcut, is the easy way out. And when we get stressed in life, and we take the easy path, the easy way out, the offerings of sin and of Satan and fall backwards. We're not taking the shortcut. We're taking the long cut. How many of you have ever been with somebody or maybe you did it yourself? <clears throat> you were going somewhere and, and they said, well, let's take the shortcut. And they didn't really know where they're going. And the shortcut turned out to be the long cut. Well, when we fall backwards into sinful behavior and take the seasoning of the world in our lives, it's going to have dreadful consequences because God is not mocked. And whatever we sow, that's what we're going to reap. And it's going to be the long way around to come back to find God. When we fall, we need to fall forward. We need to fall toward God. We need to fall on the altar and cry out to God when we're under stress and we're under difficulty and, and, uh, and, and uh, we have the capacity to do wrong and temptation is there to cause us to do wrong. Uh, what is it about going the right way that seems so hard to people? It's the easiest way. It's 
the easiest thing to do spiritually. Amen. To fall forward, but we always seem to want to fall backward. I would much rather fall forward if I have to fall down because at least I can put my hands out in front of me and catch myself and soften the blow and soften my fall. If you've ever slipped and fallen on a patch of ice and wound up on your backside in the blink of an eye, you know how painful and hurtful that can be to fall backward. And so if you've got to fall, you would prefer to fall forward where you can catch yourself. But spiritually, it seems like the opposite rule works. And when we fall, we fall away from God. Wouldn't it be so much better for us to fall forward on our face before the Lord? Fall upon the rock, upon Jesus, because he is the answer. What makes the true easy way seem so hard? Seems so hard. Well, this is one way that we learn to become seasoned. When you fall down enough and you have to get back up and you hurt yourself enough that you've learned your lessons, eventually that brings you to a point where you become seasoned in life. Hallelujah. The season you're in presents you with opportunities to try out seasonings. But the seasoning that will save us and preserve us is the salt of the word of God, the salt of Jesus Christ. It is so easy and self-evident, and yet for our flesh, it seems that it is often the last resort. Paul in Colossians 4 and 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Seasoning comes with time. It comes with life's lessons learned, which is what makes our elders so valuable and such an important resource for our lives. Why is, it, why is it so hard for young people to listen to old people? They almost invariably think they don't know what they're talking about. Well, old people may not be up to date on the latest music or on the latest trends or on the latest technology, but old people know something about getting through life. They know something about dealing with the big questions in life. They know something about dealing with choices and the consequences of those choices. They understand very well uh, the mistakes that young people made because they've made mistakes and they know. And they, they are a valuable, valuable resource. And what I really love about old people that have become well-seasoned in life and they're well-seasoned in grace, there is a calmness about them. Amen. There is a deliberation about them. There is a sure fire understanding. They stand on a solid foundation they have sought out and they have sought out questions and they have confirmed answers and they are sure of the right thing to do. And so they're a valuable resource to younger people. Don't do this. Don't go that way. This choice is going to have a terrible consequence for you if you don't listen. There's a remarkable story. And I close with this thought told about Leonardo da Vinci and his painting of the Last Supper on the Sistine Chapel. So when he was painting his masterpiece, he sought for a model to portray his Christ. And finally, at last, he found one, a chorister, a choir a boy, you know, or a teenager, a young man in one of the churches of Rome who was lovely in life and in features. And this young man's name was Pietro Bandonelli. Pietro Bandonelli. And so Leonardo hired him and used him as a model to paint the features in the face of Jesus Christ. Years passed. It took many, many years before da Vinci completed this masterpiece painting, one of the greatest pieces of art in the entire world. And it was still unfinished. But now all the disciples had been portrayed except for one, Judas Iscariot. He still needed a model for Judas Iscariot. 
Now he wanted to start, he, he, he started to find a man. He, he was looking for someone whose face was so hardened and distorted by sin. And it, it, it took him a long time to find the right face. But finally, at last, he found a beggar on the streets of Rome with a face so villainous that Leonardo shuddered when he looked at him. And he hired that man to sit for him as he painted the face of Judas on his canvas. And finally, when it was finished and he was about to dismiss the man, he said, I have not yet found out your name. The man responded and said, I am Pietro Bandinelli. I set for you as your model of Christ. Such is the sad fate of any of us who do not learn how to live out the seasons we are in without becoming seasoned by God's salt and light. So finally becoming seasoned warriors and godly Christians. We start out young and pure, but if we're not careful, if we're not careful, the seasons of life that come along and the stresses of life that come along will provide us opportunities to taste the seasonings of the world the variety that's the spice of worldly life. And having done so can reduce us and bring us to a different place. Isn't it an amazing thing that in the this famous painting of the Last Supper, the same man who sat for the face of Christ also sat for the face of Judas. That's what the seasoning of the world will do to a life that should have been temperate and moderate and defined by Christian morals and values. My plea for you today and my plea especially for the younger adults among us today, amen, is to understand, understand about life, understand about stress, and the trigger of stress and understand about how it affects and impacts our old nature and our old man and wants us to fall away into sinful behavior that will hurt us and destroy us. But my plea to you, my prayer for you today is to fall forward on the altar on the Lord Jesus Christ and to trust him and to become seasoned by the salt of the word of God, the, the preaching of the teaching of Christian life, of Christian morals, and of Christian values. Because I don't want to see you become shipwrecked and ruined and destroyed and have your life in in such a terrible manner. So we pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, I ask as we close out this service right now, that with a personal altar call for everyone that may have heard this message today, that they would learn how to surrender to prayer, learn how to surrender to faith and trust in God, learn how to go to church more when there's trouble, not stay away from church when there's trouble, learn how to pray more when there's stress and difficulty and temptation, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, which are for a season. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I plead the blood right now. I plead the blood and I plead with you to do the right things and to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you.